We agreed to get married as soon as you won your first case. Meanwhile, ten years later, my niece, the daughter of my sister, is getting married. My biological clock is ticking like this, and the way this case is going, I ain't never getting married. Love that movie. We'll always love that movie. America is getting older, not just in the lifespan of our republic, though our Declaration of Independence turns 245 this year, but that's not what I meant. I meant the age of us, the American people. It's one of the more revealing discoveries from the latest census. Our population is growing at the slowest rate since the Great Depression. Researchers say that's happening for a few reasons. One is a decline in legal immigration, legal. Then there's the Great Recession, more than a decade ago. It changed the game when it comes to job security, and it led many young adults to delay marriage and kids. Now, when many of them do have kids, they're having fewer of them. Today, the average American adult of childbearing age has 17% fewer children than in 1990. That has shifted the balance of our population. We have more seniors who are 80 and older than we have toddlers who are two or younger. That puts the U.S. pretty much in line with countries in Europe and Asia. They're seeing their populations decline. Now, this isn't all bad, not necessarily. It may be better for the environment and for our fight against climate change if countries manage their populations. Generally, birth rates also go down when societies become more educated and wealthier. But there are still some pretty serious consequences we've got to plan for. Researchers say that when you have a low population growth, in a high-income country, it likely leads to social and economic problems. Consider Japan. Its population is slowing down faster than any other country. In less than 10 years, one in three Japanese people will be 65 or older. One in three. Economists are already calling it a crisis. More than 7,000 public schools across Japan have closed down. Entire towns are clearing out. Industries are worried about labor shortages. So when we look at the U.S., what does our slowing birth rate and aging population tell us about where our country is headed? What do we do if these trends continue? Joining us now to discuss it is Jennifer Gerson. Her award-winning reporting has covered birth rates in America, women's health, and reproductive rights. Jennifer, welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me. What do these numbers from the census, at least the ones we have so far, tell you about where we're heading as a country demographically? Well, the most interesting thing to me that I thought immediately looking at this was thinking about contraception usage. And I think also just the impact that the Affordable Care Act has had on contraception access and the kinds of methods people are choosing, the fact that people are choosing longer acting methods. And I think when we look at who now has access to those methods and then the way that intersects with what has been going on with millennials since the recession in 2008 and access to high quality, long lasting birth control plus a economy that's been unstable throughout most millennials lifetime. And I think that's what you're seeing right now. People are definitely delaying starting families, growing families and Thinking really seriously, I think, like you mentioned um, in your intro about the consequences of climate change, too. Um, we know that Gen Z especially is really thinking about that in terms of their reproductive choices. And we know it's true of millennials also uh, on both sides of the aisle. You know, there was that recent Pew study that was looking at Republicans, Gen Z and millennials are incredibly concerned about climate change. So I think we're seeing the conflation of all these things. But definitely, largely, I think this is a story about access to contraception and high quality methods. Let's dig deeper into some polling numbers as well. I wonder what your sense is of the financial factors behind this. There was a New York Times morning consult poll who asked that asked adults for their reasons for having fewer children than perhaps they may have wanted. 64% among the reasons that they cited, and this is probably one of those polls where you could cite more than one, but about two thirds said that expensive childcare was their reason. More than half said they wanted more time for the children they already have. About half said they were worried about the economy. So it feels like a lot of this is not just lifestyle, but it's economic in a variety of ways. And that's now showing up in census data or has been for the last few decades. No, for sure. And I can say anecdotally, just from someone who talks to a lot of American women all day in my reporting, you hear about that and you hear from women saying how the cost of childcare is a huge burden. I mean, and we know it's keeping women out of the workforce too. People's entire salaries are often going towards childcare and sometimes that's not even meeting it. So I think we're seeing this intersection of 
families, households, and certainly women, and when women are head of households in particular, probably trying to figure out, well, how is this going to make sense if I need to support the family I have, which is, again, often the case, and make the numbers add up at the end of the month when we just know the cost of child care is astronomical. It almost feels like, and I don't know if you see it this way, but at least for me, it feels like we're having two kinds of conversations mm -hmm. about the birth rate in America. One is this kind of macro conversation about the nation's economy and our national security and our standing in the world. And the other is this conversation about each family as a data point in this massive cloud of census data saying, what do I want to do with my household? For women, what do I want to do with my body as it relates to mm -hmm. having children? And sometimes these conversations line up and most of the time they don't. And I feel like that's part of the problem, at least as I perceive it. But how do you see it? Yeah, I think that's a really accurate read on the situation. And as somebody who in my own work and reporting is typically focused on those individuals and their individual households, the larger national geopolitical conversations are not really impacting people on their decision making. They're thinking about the conversations they're having at their own kitchen tables at the end of the day and stack of bills on the table and hours in a day and how to make the, the numbers work out. It's a huge concern for people. Um, I mean, I, I have a friend I remember who once said there's nothing worse than being a woman in your 40s because you have aging parents and you have elementary school age children. And you know, usually you're at a pretty good point in your career too, where you're starting to feel established. You're starting to really gain some momentum and you are running out of hours, yet alone dollars. And we know that there's such huge disparities in terms of what's going on with women of color in the workforce in this country right now too, and how this is definitely impacting their family building choices. And we saw that really significantly in terms of the pandemic. Um, I think that really brought it into focus and perhaps in a way that people weren't thinking about before too. Now the flip side of that of course is that when you see what the birth rates are, the population of children in a particular area, that has a snowball effect that also affects the factors around starting a family. You know, if there are fewer, I used to live in San Francisco where there were a lot of families with children that moved out, where there were some places where there were more people with dogs than people with kids. And as a result of that, that made some of the lotteries to get into certain public schools maniacally hard to win. It was like playing Powerball. So when you have economic factors that make it harder to have families, that shows up in the census number, which affects the budgets for your city and county, which affects schooling, which has this kind of, it's like a Mobius strip of factors that affects families kind of going and coming. It feels almost like a cycle that's incredibly hard to break. Yeah, for sure. And I think women are bearing the brunt of this psychological weight too and trying to reconcile how am I going to make this all make sense? How am I going to afford a family, get my kids into school, get them into high quality schools in my community? And, you know, we do, we have a real crisis in terms of, I think, public education in this country, we see the disparity in terms of access. And yeah, I think that's an excellent point. And I think it is a vicious cycle and something that, you know, hopefully could potentially be addressed by some, you know, federal and local government initiatives to help provide some relief for families and relief to school districts too. And again, I think I am curious and maybe the worst way to see what the next census will look like when we kind of are coming out of this pandemic period too, to see how this is further aggravated this um, exact situation, especially when it comes to access to public education. Yeah, no easy solutions for this one, that's for sure. Jennifer Gerson, I appreciate you making time to help us think this through. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for having me.